My name is Louis Aldawi, and I'm a consultant in transfusion medicine at Northern Ireland Blood Transfusion Service, NIBTS. Today, we are going to talk about platelet transfusion. We talk about collection and storage of platelets. We talk about choice of platelet product, prophylactic platelet transfusion, platelet transfusion dose, therapeutic platelet transfusion, and finally we will list the BSH guidelines on platelet transfusion refractiveness. This is uh, the platelet actually can be made from a whole blood unit, as you can see in the picture. This is a whole blood unit which was which. Uh, was allowed to settle on a shelf. The red blood cells will be at the bottom and the plasma will be at the top and in between the red blood cells and the plasma we have the puffy coat where the platelets aggregate or congregate. Now using high technology methods we could squeeze the plasma out of the puffy coat and get platelet concentrates the other way and the new methods of cutting platelets is by using apheresis technology where the patient is hooked up to a machine the whole blood is taken out of the donor and processed in, in the machine then the whole blood minus the platelets will be returned back to the donor we could use apheresis technology for leukophoresis erythrophoresis plasmapheresis as well as stem cell collection as you can see in this slide, actually, since 1997, there has been an increasing number of phoresis collected platelets. The UK Blood Service aims to provide more than 80% of platelet doses by apheresis to reduce the exposure of patients to multiple donors. Now we talk about platelet in additive solution. Uh, the main purpose of this platelet component actually is to reduce the plasma in a platelet component. Typically, a platelet component will have 300 mL plasma uh, plus the platelets. In this uh, way, actually, we replace 200 mL of plasma by platelet additive solution, and this will obviously reduce the antibodies in the platelet comp component. So if you have an O platelet, the amount of anti-A and anti-B will be reduced. If you have an AB platelet, the amount of soluble AB antigen will be significantly reduced. According to the PSH guidelines, patients with a history of allergic transfusion reaction, apart from mild, we use platelets suspended in PIAs. Now, if the reactions are quite severe, then we use 100% PIAs, which means um, the platelet component will have no plasma at all. If you use 100% PIS, then the expiration date will be changed to 24 hours instead of the routine 5 to 7 days, as we know. Where are platelets used? In the UK, 70% of, of platelet units are used by hematology departments, 10% by cardiac surgery, 10% by intensive treatment units, and 10% by other departments. How long can platelets be stored? Um, typically, platelets are stored for five days if unopened, and four hours once opened. Now, with the bacterial screening, we could extend the shelf life of platelets to seven days. Platelets are typically stored in room temperature because refrigerated platelets are easily removed from the blood. They have to be under continuous and gentle agitation, and it's okay to have platelets without ag agitation for 24 hours, and that's especially when you need to transfer platelets from the transfusion center to faraway places. One of the main differences between red blood cells and platelets is that irradiated platelets have no expiration change while as you know if we irradiate red blood cells then uh, the total shelf life will be reduced to 28 in total as you know in the UK if uh, the 
uh, irradiated red blood cells actually will have 14 days only after irradiation, but you, you have an extra 14 days before irradiation, so a total period of 28 days. The main quality control issue with platelet storage is having a pH over 6.2 at the end of storage. What are the compatibility guidelines for matching Fourier's platelet products with transfusion recipients at NIPTS? with regard to ABO compatibility. This is a very important step. As you know, previously, uh, it was thought that any type of platelet component can be given to any type of, of patient. This is now coming to an end. And the reason for that is that uh, we found out that identical ABO Transfusion is much better, that's what we explain in the next slide. And therefore, we use platelets with the same ABO as the patient whenever possible. Now, obviously, if the patient is O, then he will not have any antigen. Then you don't need to use high theta negative uh, platelet components. Or when you are transfusing AB platelets, there will be no antibodies in the plasma, then you don't need to use high theta negative. But if you are transfusing A to B or B to A, then obviously there will be high theta negative anti A or anti B, because 10% of the pop of the population, 10% uh, of uh, group A and group B people have high antigen expression. Now in the neonates and children, it's different. We try to avoid group O platelets to non-group O neonates. What makes this, uh, what, what, why this policy makes sense? Why do we have to use ABO identical platelets? Is a study published in Transfusion Journal in 2008. And this is a prospective single center study which examined 9,923 mainly prophylactic platelet transfusions given to 672 patients treated for hematologic malignancies between 1997 and 2004. Patients who received ABO identical platelet transfusion had the best corrected count increment or post-transfusion increment. Now, if we used a group O platelet to group A patients, and that's what we call minor mismatch, or if we use group A platelets to group O, patients, that's what we call major mismatch. The increment was not as good. Now, if we use group A to uh, B or A or B to A, or what that's what we call bidirectional mismatch, the increment was the worst. Now, what are the compatibility guidelines for matching phoresis? platelet products with transfusion recipient at NIPTS with regard to RHD compatibility. Now, it's very important to recognize that platelets don't have RHD antigen on their surface. Uh, we only take care of this because there will always be a minimal red blood cell transfused with the platelet component. And that's when, when we worry actually that there will be an aluminization to the anti, to the D antigen on the red blood cells. The recommendations are D negative platelets should be given to D negative patients where possible, particularly to D negative women less than 51 years of age, because that's childbearing age. If unavailable, RHD positive platelets can be given with IV anti D prophylaxis. We don't use IM intramuscular because these patients are thrombocytopenic and there's a risk of developing hematoma if you use intramuscular anti D. Um, for RHD negative boys under 18 years of age or those who already have anti D antibodies and transfusion dependent adults, the platelets of choice are RHD negative. D positive may be transfused if D negative unavailable. And in such cases, we don't really have to give anti D to the patients. 
use leukocyte reduced platelets. Elimination of white cells from platelets reduces cytokine production and platelet white cell count conjugate formation. If you don't remove white cell count from your platelet component, then it will have more than 1,000 fold of cytokines compared to a healthy individual. Data from six randomized control trials showed association between non leukocyte reduced platelet transfusion and post operative infection, stroke, and death in cardiac surgery. Stroke rate threefold higher and death rate upwards of sevenfold higher when non leukocyte reduced platelets transfused for coronary artery bypass graft patients' surgery. Leukocyte reduction reduces refractiveness. The trial to reduce aluminization to platelets, or what we call TRAP trial, compared uh, what was I use actually there were 530 acute myeloid leukemia patients and some of them received non leukocyte reduced pooled platelets and the other arm they used leukocyte reduced pooled platelets obviously the aluminization rate was uh, was quite different uh, 45% is a non leukocyte reduced arm and 18% is a leukocyte reduced arm which means that aluminization rate has dropped significantly by reducing the leukocyte count the refractiveness rate has dropped from 13 percent in the non-leukocyte reduced arm to three percent in the leukocyte reduced arm however there was no change on the incidence of platelet specific antibodies <coughs> Now we talk about therapeutic platelet transfusions. Platelets obviously are used to treat bleeding due to critically decreased circulating platelet count. In severe bleeding, try to maintain platelet count above 50. In patients with multiple trauma, traumatic brain injury or spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage, we try to maintain the platelet count above 100. In patients with bleeding that is not considered severe or life-threatening, we keep the platelet count over 30. Now, with regard to platelet function disorders, we don't use platelet transfusion for patients with congenital platelet function disorders. We use recombinant factor 7A in Glansman from Pacinia and tranexamic acid plus desmopressine for Bernard Soler. Now, if pharmaceutical therapies are contraindicated or ineffective or there is life-threatening bleeding, then we would use platelet transfusion. Don't use platelet transfusion pre-procedure when antiplatelet agents have not been discontinued because the transfused platelets will acquire the same dysfunction as the patient's platelet. Now, this, is, this slide actually shows a platelet and on the surface of the platelet, there are different antigens. You can see glycoprotein 2B3A, and the absence of glycoprotein 2B3A will cause Glanzman thrombocytopenia. So, if patient has Glanzman thrombocytopenia, uh, he will not recognize glycoprotein 2B3A as a normal antigen because he lacks this antigen, and he will produce antibodies towards any platelet which expresses glycoprotein 2B3A and therefore he will destroy it and that's the reason why we don't use platelet transfusion in such case. The same principle applies to Bernard Solier syndrome where they lack glycoprotein 1B but it's not as severe as Glanzman thrombocytopenia. Prophylactic platelet transfusion it's very important to recognize that platelet transfusion for prophylactic purposes um, have to be minimized as much as possible. As I always say, the problem with prophylactic platelet transfusion is giving platelet to somebody who doesn't need platelet rather than not giving platelet to somebody who needs it. Uh, in the past, we used a threshold of 20,000. 
several randomized, randomized control trials showed that 10,000 is, uh, is, is better because there is no difference in hemorrhagic risks between 10,000 and 20,000. We don't give platelet transfusions routinely prior to bone marrow aspirate or trephan biopsy. We don't give it prior to peak lines or traction of CVCs or cataract surgery. Avoid platelet transfusion in renal failure because patients with renal failure obviously will have uh, dysfunctional platelets because of the uremia and the transfused platelets will acquire the same dysfunction. So what you end up doing is exposing the patient to more platelets and giving him the risks of platelet transfusion without any benefit. What is a reasonable dose for prophylactic platelet transfusion? Um, in this study, they, uh, um, low dose, medium dose, or high dose were administered to 1,272 patients with hypoproliferative thrombocytopenia. When the platelet count dropped below 10,000, and then they assessed the outcome, the results showed that there was no significant effect on incidence of bleeding, and the lower doses were associated with fewer absolute number of platelet needed, but more platelet transfusion events. So the lower doses were given on more days, but the total amount of platelet exposure was reduced and therefore the conclusion is to use one unit of platelet transfusion for prophylactic purposes. Uh, one unit in the UK will be around 3 times 10 to the 11th. Uh, we usually give it for patients with reversible bone marrow failure receiving intensive chemotherapy or undergoing allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplant to maintain a platelet count above 10. We will consider increasing the threshold for prophylactic platelet transfusion to between 10 to 20 in patients judged to have additional risk factors for bleeding like fever, infection, acute promyelostic leukemia, antifungal medication, or amphotericin. When do you need to avoid platelet transfusion? in ITP, PTP, HIT, because obviously there is an antibody which would destroy the transfused platelets, and also TTP, you wouldn't give platelet transfusion unless it's life-threatening bleeding. What is the absolute platelet count increments? In, in the UK, uh, we use the level of 5,000. If they don't show an increase of more than 5,000, 10 minutes or one hour after the transfusion, then we consider it poor response or refractory. Please bear in mind that you have to use ABO identical product uh, to call it refractory. I'm listing here with uh, PSH guidelines with regarding to platelet transfusion refractoriness. And here are the causes of platelet transfusion refractoriness. And here is a clinical case. Now what you could do, actually, you could pause the video and try to answer the question. And then we'll, in the next slide, I'll explain the results. As you can see in this clinical case scenario, the patient here is a man. And men usually they have less chance of having anti-HLA antibodies. The patient has myelofibrosis and complaining of early satiety, which tells me he's got splenomegaly. 80% of platelet refractoriness is caused by non-immune causes and on the top list of splenomegaly, and that's what happened here. When they tell you in the scenario that the patient has recently become transfusion dependent, this means that the patient has not been exposed to HLA antigens for, long, for a long enough period to develop anti-HLA antibodies. And therefore, the best answer is continue routine platelet transfusion and screen for anti-HLA antibodies. Thank you for your attention.